I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Q&A. My cousin David is joining us today. Um, Milo isn't with us. He's not feeling well, so he will be on next week. Uh, so, Tom, we don't, and we don't have a lot of questions, but we got some other things we can discuss also that sort of or carryovers from uh, the campfire talk we did this week. So you want to go ahead and give us the first question, Tom? Well, the questions we do have are excellent questions. And so these are, uh, we're just going to dig right in. And this one is, my question is about spider crawling. Could someone explain what this is and if it would actually be possible? Well, hmm. you know, we had actually, there was a lady who was on the show, and I don't remember the episode, it was some time ago, but her and her daughter were in, actually in New Mexico, and one of these creatures crossed the road in front of their car, and that's how she described it. And I don't know, I don't know if spider crawl is the exact, a good descriptive term, but you know, they seem to be going on all fours, but very low to the ground. Um, I know you guys have heard of that before. I mean, I, I don't know what you guys would describe it as or how you would describe it. Chuck, what do you think? I know you've heard I people talk about it. I think they more hands than people realize. You think so? Yeah. What do you think, Chuck? I know you've heard a few of these. Um, yeah, actually, the, the the gentleman that I was talking about that, that I researched with, um, he actually saw one uh, doing that one night. Um, he heard what sounded like a baby crying, and he recorded it. And uh, he went back and and played played the audio. And when he did, he uh, said he got this uneasy feeling that he was being watched. And he turned on his spotlight out in the middle of the field, and he said this thing was. Uh, was on on its belly pretty much and uh, going across the field looking like it was like it was trying to swim and um, when he shot the spotlight in his in his face uh, this thing turned and went a different direction but uh, he said it was the most unusual thing he had ever seen and he said it it basically was on his belly and uh, was had its arms out like it was trying to swim across the field which is kind of weird that is weird tom you and i spoke to someone and i won't mention who because uh they they asked us not to because of their profession but uh mm-hmm. this person witnessed one in southern washington and at first they thought it was a bear because it was down low <clears throat> and and it was moving um, and then it stood up, it was in this road and, and they were able to look down the road and it was a T intersection at the end of the road. So, uh, it was, you know, kind of a corridor, a forest on either side going down this road, but it was open at the other end. Apparently there was a field on the other side of the T. So when the creature stood up and walked away, it was highlighted by that, uh, that light, you know, coming in from the other end of the road where the T intersection was. And then they could see that it was a creature on two legs, human-like, but it wasn't human. It was covered hair, et cetera. Uh, and she she did see deer um, at the same location. So I, I, I postulated that it was probably, you know, in that pose hunting the deer, you know, or stalking them. Mm-hmm. Well, and, you know, my next-door neighbor, Rich, you know, we've had him on. For. Um, and he actually saw one of these things a couple hundred yards away crossing the road on all fours and it just kind of for lack of a better word it, it, he said it freaked him out it was like what is this thing and 
and um, so. Was it in a posture like that, where it was that low, where it gave kind of a weird way of moving, or or just regularly on all fours? Okay, so it was. I would have to go back and ask him, uh, you know, what was it, you know, what was it like? And he said it was very strange, and the back of the creature was absolutely flat, just perfectly flat. And, um, you know, he just didn't know what to, what to think about. He said that was the ugliest elk he'd ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> David, what do you think? Whenever I hear that, I'm I'm picturing almost like somebody in the push-up position if the back is completely flat. And I could see their fingers being strong enough to support their weight and move along the ground like that, but not their toes. Forrest, what do you think? <laughs> uh, well, that is, <clears throat> that's more cat-like than it is uh, primate-like. I've never seen another primate do anything like that. So um, I'm sure there's a lot of primates out there that I haven't seen. So uh, uh, far be it for me to probably, I shouldn't make a statement like that, but the, the ones that I know about, I've never seen uh, walk like that, and and they're I guess they're referring to when they get up on their fingers and toes and and walk like, uh, you know, use those as a support means. But I mean that almost that reminds me of a cat when they get down flat to the ground and uh, you know and they're in a hunting posture. But um, using that to cross the road is very bizarre. Yeah, when the lady described that, it was uh, they were pretty creeped out by it. Uh, and I can't imagine why they would do it on a highway, but, uh, I mean, who knows? I mean, we're not in their heads, so we don't know yeah, what they're doing. Well, it is kind of creepy behavior. I mean, really. It, it is for sure. And maybe, I don't know, if you're trying to stay out of sight, maybe you move like that in a place that's real open. Well, if it's across well, the road and it's nighttime, I mean, most roads are black, you know, tar. Well, that, was, dark that was broad daylight when she saw that. Oh, well, it was broad daylight? Yeah. It's a well, head scratcher. I thought maybe he was trying to get below the lights or something. Yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. Well, Tom, what do we got next? Okay. Um, well, for Will, part one, when you find twisted or bent trees, do you record location and compass direction, uh, direction the tree is pointing to later to look at on the map to see well, where where is it pointing to? Well, is there some significance to that area? Only only relatively recently we started doing that, um, so we haven't got enough information to make any determination if there's any relevance to it or not. Chuck, do you do that when you're doing work? I ha I have in the past. There there was a location uh, in Arbuckle Lake where we actually found um, tree breaks that were all pointing in the same direction and uh, thought thought that was kind of weird. There was probably about five or six uh, tree breaks in this one particular area. And um, the, way, the way that this was formed, uh, those those tree breaks were all pointed in the same direction and that it, it was where our campground was oh that's kind of creepy isn't it <laughs> oh yeah yeah oh yeah you know when we were in the field in july I, we found a number of tree breaks but i don't believe they were pointing in the same direction which is probably a good thing for us yeah right <laughs> uh <laughs> they were we took a look at them and you know they were pointed in some other direction so but uh it was interesting Forrest we were before we started recording we were talking about something uh that had to deal with autism and and I can't remember how we were going to formulate that into a question mm -hmm. but it sort of came from the discussion we were having before on campfire talk about um domestication syndrome and and you had some thoughts about 
autism with that. I don't know if you want, do you want to talk about that a bit? Well, it, mine wasn't specifically directed at autism, but uh, I had, uh, I think I told you that uh, I had, while y'all were talking about that, uh, I had pulled out some old anthropology books and um, I just wondered if, um, you know, that they refer, they kept referring to in the uh, anthropology books. Now y'all have to remember I'm, I'm, I'm aged. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that, uh, it's all a matter of semantics, I think sometimes, but they call it low cost, uh, the development of low cost contractile behavior on the part of humans. In other words, repetitive, uh, behaviors, uh, do cause you to lose a lot of things. Uh, uh, the fast twitch muscles is, is one thing that we've lost that primates, uh, such as your great apes, uh, your gorillas and chimpanzees have retained. And, uh, we can control our muscle, uh, strength, uh, whereas they can't, when they take a swing at you, you're getting the full force of it and they can't really, they don't have the ability to stop that. But the other thing that, that I had brought up, <clears throat> because I had remembered that there was something else uh, in regards to uh, the development of agricultural uh, and, and, and referring to agriculture, I also remain, uh, refer to the domestication of animals um, and that um, uh, and the use of fire and fire really uh, uh, prompted our uh, sedentary behavior and uh, uh, the development of our agricultural processes. And it, we have um, a gene in us called the AMY1, and it controls the uh, saliva analyze, which uh, allows us to process starch. Uh, and, you know, this is, of course, helpful when we started cooking foods and such as that, because, you know, our brains suck up all that glucose and, and uh, protein. We need that. And what I was kind of wondering about is that um, with this development of fire and cooking, could that have prompted the this uh, progression of this gene and maybe it uh, actually progressing to the point that uh, um, it was so developed? And now this is just a guess on my part because I really have no idea. Uh, that it's so developed that our brains have adapted now and they don't need to be as large as they used to be and that they are continually shrinking because this maybe this gene is actually allowing our uh, brains to uh, process this, uh, what we need to uh, process and feed our brains. And uh, so therefore we don't have to have as much brains to, to do that because it's not affecting our cognitive abilities. Um, and I, I really wonder, you know, when they say that, uh, you know, that one uh, uh, podcast that you had recommended that I watch, uh, that we've lost all the size of a, a lemon in our brain, I, I'm, it, they never did explain what part of the brain we, exactly. we were losing. It. No. Is, is it one and, portion or is it overall? <laughs> Yeah, that, that's what I was kind of curious about. Is it something that, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, this low cost contractual, contractual, I can't even say it now, contractual behavior is causing us to not have to, uh, we're not out there for, you know, literally digging in the dirt, you know, with our hands and, and our little uh, shovels and such like we used to, uh, you know, say 10,000 years ago or even 3,000 years ago. We're not, uh, we're not you know, exercising our bodies to that extent like we used to. And so uh, would this be uh, conducive to the fact that, uh, you know, maybe we are domesticating ourselves in that respect? So, uh, uh, that, you know, maybe we're losing the parts that uh, control that type of, you know, uh, function. I, I don't know because they never did explain exactly what part of the brain we're losing. So I guess it would uh, be not our cognitive function. So I, I, I guess mean, you could probably intelligence. yeah, you could probably find that. I would suppose that the other animal species that whose brains have shrunk also when they call it, you know as part of the uh, domestication syndrome. Um, if they were tested to see if their brains were 
or if their you know processing of the same kinds of foods were similar to ours. Well, yeah, and and you know they were they they were taking that skull from um, uh, oh gosh, where was that that original skull from that they found that was so much larger. Uh, and I mean that was a Homo sapien sapien too. It wasn't uh, you know uh, an archaic uh, human. Uh, it um, uh, the the cranial case was much larger than ours. But you almost need to open up those cranial cases and and then uh, I don't know enough about the brain and all the functions uh, in the brain because that wasn't something that I ever focused on. But uh, you'd have to almost look at the comparison of uh, what is lacking in, in ours versus what's in that one and uh, to determine maybe possibly what parts of the brain are shrinking. Uh, and, and almost the implication was, and I don't know, you, you tell me if you got this, was that it was kind of an overall thing. So Right. And uh, one thing, <clears throat> excuse me, one thing um, that I remember from my psych course is when they talked about you know, when we worked on different parts of the brain and their functions, uh, a lot of that mass has to do with memory storage. So, you know, you could lose some of that memory storage that may not be necessary for survival without losing the other more important brain functions. Well, yeah. And we don't know anything about the thickness of the bone of that larger skull also. Well, that's the, uh, that's true too. That the, the 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 bone structure looked much heavier than ours, but so which would lead to the uh, larger uh, cranial size. But the interior, the interior portion of it, the brain uh, is what he was implying was much larger than than uh, than ours as well. So yeah, I didn't. Uh, I should have jotted down the numbers that he quoted. You know, from one one brain case to the other one, <clears throat> because it was fairly significant, but. Um, it looked to be, I, I, if I remember correctly, it's about, I'm going to say anywhere from 400 to 500 cc's. That's a lot. Yeah. Well, the size of a lemon in your brain is a lot, you know? It is. Oh, <laughs> That's especially. What they, they compared it to. Especially when <laughs> you look at, I think the difference between yeah. Neanderthals and Homo sapiens is about 200 cc's, isn't it? Mm, it's a little, yeah. It, it, it ranges uh, anywhere from two to 400, yeah. So for that one to be, you know, let's say 400 cc's, that's a pretty significant amount, you know, in it within yeah. a single species. Yeah, and, and you have to consider, too, that Neanderthal's frontal portion of their their frontal lobes were pushed back. It was that they had a, fl- a flattened skull case. Different so, shape, yeah. Uh, it, it's going to be a different shape of uh, skull, but they were, they actually had larger brains than, than we had. So, right. right. Uh, but, uh, you know what uh, the portions of their brains that were more developed uh, and versus uh, uh, and ours, I'm not even quite sure of what it is. So, like I said, that wasn't something that I ever focused on. Maybe I should have, but uh, I didn't. We were just—it was just not something that people. You, they didn't teach it when I was going to school, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that maybe they didn't know either. So, well, and I never heard these terms either when I was in college. So. You know, taking my anthro courses, uh, and this, you know, this uh, domestication syndrome is probably a new stamp on an old, um, you know, thinking on this. Maybe it was something they noticed yeah. but didn't know much about. And nobody really studied it. Yeah, well, it's like everybody has to have a name for something. So nowadays, I mean, we have to have a uh, uh, you put a, your stamp a label on it. for everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Tom. Where? Are we, what do we have next? Uh oh, did we lose Tom? He's probably on mute. Let's see. <coughs> Are you there, Tom? Hmm. Uh oh. Well. Hope he's okay. I'm here. There he can you is. guys hear me? Yeah, I, we can hear mm, you. Yeah. <laughs> There's that M U T E button that was engaged. <laughs> I don't you know, know, you know on my mic, to do with it, on my mic, it wants sometimes. I mean, you can't just push the button on and off for mute. You gotta, it's gotta control it a little bit and figure out if it's gonna decide if it's gonna come on or go off or exactly. <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe it's these Yeti mics that are just uncooperative. I don't know. They are, yeah. 
I like the mic, but you don't like its behavior. It's kind of like the Sasquatch. You like the Sasquatch, but you don't really like its behavior. <laughs> Right, exactly. Well, it is a Yeti mic now. Come on, guys. We need some domestication syndrome in the Sasquatches. Are, are we, seeing, we, we need to smack the mic around a bit. Oh, no, that's, that's behavior be modification. Like that, would be, that would be taming. That's not domestication syndrome. Sorry. <laughs> Whatever it takes. I don't care. All right. What do we got, Tom? Oh gosh! All right, so what are we looking at? We're looking at questions or questions. But what, uh, what's that? Questions. Questions. Okay. All right. So I believe this gentleman is Danny. He says I have a few questions for the show. Before us, in your recent encounter <clears throat> with the juvenile, did you go back to the location and check for tracks or other signs? We actually did the next day, but uh, <clears throat> it was sitting in the middle of the road, and it's a paved road. And <clears throat> we actually went and looked on the side of the road, but it's all grassy. All that uh, median there uh, was grassy, and then it went into the uh, concrete culvert. And uh, that concrete culvert, there's no way that you can uh, track anything in that. So, uh, And it's it's a big, big culvert there that they had to to put the county had to come in and put in because when they first put this road in they raised the level of it and it was uh that particular spring we got a lot of rain and it was flooding my barn and i was not a real happy camper so they had to come in they sent a hydrologist out and put that big culvert in there so it's not not when i say a culvert it's not one of those big metal things actually one goes under the road there but um the and, you know, I never thought we maybe I should uh, check in in that thing. That could be some place that they're actually coming through, too. But anyway, aside from that, um, this huge culvert is just all cemented there and um, to prevent the the side of the road from eroding from the heavy rains. And kind of direct it away from my property. OK, you know, I used to wonder. Well, so interesting, though. I used to wonder in the Northwest, uh, you see a lot of culverts in the mountains, and, and oftentimes they're really big ones. And I used to wonder if they didn't sometimes either hide in those, you know, if people were around in an area, because who's going to, you know, hang themselves around to go look in the bottom of a big culvert. And we're talking, you know, culverts, it can be, geez, you know, up to 10 feet across. Yeah, they have those like that in Alaska, and they build them under the roads. Uh, quite frequently up there because uh, they're, they're big enough that the moose and the bear can actually go through those things and they don't have them going across the roads. Right, right. Or like in the Cascades, you know, you get, you know, massive amounts of water that hit the mountain sometimes and you might get a little a little stream and you think, well, geez, that's kind of a big culvert for that little trickle. But, you know, within a half an hour, it could be a raging torrent through that thing, you know, because of the collection of all the surrounding mountainsides. Oh, yeah, when it starts melting. Oh, yeah, yeah. What do you guys think, Chuck and uh, David? Want to weigh in? Uh, did an investigation in Ponca City uh, that had um, the creek bed about, oh, 100 to 200 yards from our house. And uh, there, there was a big culvert that went underneath the highway and actually found tracks inside the culvert where they were coming through the culvert and going up to her property. So they they do use those on occasion. I've heard of them using culverts like that as well if they're trying to avoid really heavily populated areas to get back to their areas in the woods that go under the street, like the 8-foot, 10-foot kind. Okay, well, Tom, what else do we have? This person had several questions, right? Yeah, there's uh, there's a handful of questions here. Okay, now, from your last episode, um, can you suggest to guess that she gets a case of 
Bud Light beer because the cans are bright blue and once they're empty, use rubber gloves to wipe them down, a cloth to remove human fingerprints, stirring them all together through through the hole. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, all right, so, so this I, is an interesting... I have a question. So what happens... Okay, so you have to empty those cans. You're not just going to pour the beer out on the ground, so are you going to remember to do all that? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. That's a danger-laden um, experiment there. <laughs> Very much so. Uh, who are they uh, suggesting do this? Well, they're... I don't know if he's suggesting... Well, I'll, I'll tell you something I did back in the 80s. When I first started working the area south of Mount St. Helens, and I can't remember what prompted me to think to do this, but I was trying to see, you know, if the creatures were actually still in this particular area that the locals had told me, you know, years before there'd been a lot of sightings. So what I did was I took um, some cardboard, cut it into four-inch squares, and I wrapped it with aluminum foil. And I took fishing line and I hung those up uh, from, you know, real small twigs on the ends of tree limbs, you know, where the where the foil would be about 10 feet off the ground. So no, no regular animal or, you know, anything would be able to climb out there and grab this thing. And they would dangle in the breeze and they were in positions where they could be seen from long distances. And I left them out there for a couple of weeks and I went back and they were all gone. They'd been torn down and they weren't on the ground. They were taken. So I, I don't know, you know, if the creatures did it or what happened, but uh, I didn't I didn't pursue that because I didn't get any results, you know, with footprints or anything, but it wasn't the greatest ground for footprints. So uh, I picked the spot more based on, you know, long-range visibility than the kind of ground where footprints would show up. Huh. Okay. So it was kind of a well, success, but it wasn't, I mean, because it was inconclusive. Yeah. Well, um, all right. So he goes on. My youngest son has taken an interest in overnight hikes in the wilderness with his girlfriend. And last year he hiked up Mount Thielson, North Crater Lake. Okay. He camped above the tree line, and I warned him to watch for things that didn't seem right or odd sounds. We have had the discussion regarding Bigfoot, and while it concerns him, he does believe they do exist. He still wants to do things and live the life. Or, of course, I have concerns, especially after speaking with you and Tom. And the suspected fatalities south of Ashland and further north in Deschutes County. Not to mention the many disappearances which have never been resolved both here and well, many, you know, many other places along with Tom's experiences east of Eugene. I really do need to get a copy of all of your latest book you know <clears throat> this is a subject that a lot of people take with a rather cavalier attitude and if if it were something like you were going out after a grizzly bear you wouldn't take that same attitude for obvious reasons and I, you should have the exactly the same attitude that you would going out looking for grizzlies. The only difference is these things have a much higher level of intelligence on top of that danger uh, element that's attached to them. So, I mean, you know, everybody's free to do what they want to do, but I, I would exercise extreme caution and not going alone. And, and, you know, yeah, my latest field guide is a, a good start to, um, you know, being able to understand the creatures, their behavior, 
and some tips of what you should and shouldn't do when you're out there. I don't know. What do you all think? Be smart. I agree with you. What was that, Forrest? I just said I totally agree with you. I mean, you know, I, I, I'll tell you what. I was watching a video last night of a, it was a gorilla, a male big silverback, and <clears throat> there was a female, a full-grown female, and she was just, uh, she was aggravating him. Uh, it looked like she was just playing around, messing around, and she. But it was aggravating him. He literally picked her up and tossed her about twelve feet. And we're talking about a full-grown uh, female gorilla. Good lord! <laughs> and yeah, and he just tossed her about twelve feet, and uh, she just she came up and she kind of sat there like and looked at him like, "What the heck?" And he just meandered off. And I thought, you know. We're, you're dealing with an animal with in Bigfoot that's they're massive. usually twice the you know that's twice the size, twice the weight, and probably two to three times the strength of a gorilla with a grumpy disposition. With a, with, a, with a terrible disposition, and and let's face it, gorillas are actually well known for having good dispositions. Mm-hmm. You know, they're pretty, you know, pretty docile. Uh, yeah. yeah, they're pretty docile. And um, she just had pushed his buttons one too many times. <laughs> and he was like, out of here, woman. And that was his solution to the problem. And I thought, you know, that's a good thing. <laughs> just throw her <laughs> off the <laughs> side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just throw her, you know, toss her all the ways. That would get her attention. And uh, But I'm just thinking, you know, that, can you imagine how far a darn Bigfoot would throw a toss you? Oh, good I mean, a, a human? Uh, we they they tossed you into the next county. Yeah, you don't want uh, you know, to find and, out. How many trees would be hit before you got there? <laughs> Good grief! Well, so, Ch- anyway. Chuck David, what do you guys think? Yeah, I agree with you on that. I think you should just be smart when you go out into the woods. You need to respect the woods and the wilderness. Respect what's in it. Don't be stupid. Well said. Yep. Well, everyone, we're out of time for this session. Thanks for joining us. Keep sending us great questions, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's william, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there. <laughs>